there's a lot of work being done to ensure that, okay, we have mobile phone masts, fiber is being laid. You know, we're making sure that connect, wires are everywhere to make sure people are connected. So why, why aren't people using this infrastructure? Why is there no connection? Why are, still, why are there billions of people in the world today that are still unconnected? I have experienced how access to the internet or having that access can transform one's life. I remember 17, 18 years ago, going into an internet cafe and looking for graduate schools so I could come to a country and study with a scholarship. And I knew how to use the internet. I knew what kind of information to look for, the type of courses that I wanted. And because of that, I was able to change, um, yeah, my entire life. I work at the Swedish program for ICT in developing regions, and that is an acronym for SPIDER. We are located at Data System Wetenskap, which is a DSV. SPIDER as a resource center focuses on working with digital infrastructure development, connecting people that are offline, and ensuring that access to information, access to all sorts of resources that are available through digital means can reach as many people as possible. SDG 9 is at the heart of realizing the rest of the goals. If you don't have roads, if you don't have water and sewage uh, pipes, or you don't have energy generating systems or communication infrastructure such as fiber, mobile phone masts, the much needed services such as health, education, uh, transportation, and even communication, those remain unattainable. So the infrastructure forms the foundation upon which we can realize the rest of these SDGs. According to the statistics in the least developed countries, you have connectivity or mobile broadband coverage of 79%. But the number of people connected is less than 20%. Number of pe people connecting to this infrastructure is less than 20%. And then you start to ask yourself, what is the problem? In trying to understand why the fact that all this infrastructure is available but is not being used, it's really important for us to look at the social structures, the people, and what orders or organizes their lives. How do these structures actually impact or influence their access to this infrastructure? I'll take up an example with one of our partners in Bangladesh. Um, I think we all know uh, or remember the atrocious, atrocious uh, treatment of the Rohingya group of people that ended up migrating into various refugee camps in Bangladesh. There's a lot of ethnic violence going on at the moment. There's a lot of migration to nearby countries because some of these groups feel threatened and they feel as if maybe the only way you can find some sort of safety is to leave your, your country. Some of the most marginalized groups of people are the ones who need information the most to be able to understand not only the situation they find themselves in, but how best to get out of that as well. The situation we have with migrant communities is that they have very limited access to a host of services, whether it's sanitation, whether it's drugs or health information, education, you name it. They have very limited access to all these sectors. So having information that helps them to be able to make informed choices, to understand that what it means, especially now, that we must wash our hands regularly. We must keep distance from each other or, you know, practice all sorts of social measures, uh, special measures to ensure that we don't contract this coronavirus. Having access to this information is very critical. Are they getting access? What are the problems? 
And herein is where our partner realizes that, okay, the mobile phone would be a brilliant device through which uh, the community in Rohingya camp, refugee camps, can actually get access to information. But first of all, we had to understand what does the situation look like in terms of do they have access to mobile phones? What do their education levels look like? Um, what possibilities could be hindering them from using mobile devices already now? So we partnered with a research partner in Bangladesh who went in to first start study the communities um, and immediately realized that you're dealing with a community that has very strong cultural values that they hold very dear. And some of these values really make it difficult for them to engage with mobile devices. Religion, for example, is very dear to uh, the Rohingya community. And what that means is that they want to protect their own. They want to protect their cultural heritage and so forth. What is it that they are likely to be exposed to and how is that going to impact their social positions or their cultural values and, and religious beliefs? Um, and so because of that religious affiliation or that social cultural position, there's a lot of resistance to the mobile device. The other reason we discovered is that the socio-economic situation that many of these uh, migrant communities find themselves in makes the use of a mobile device um, almost, you know, elusive, unattainable, if you may. What happens is that a mobile device is very demanding. It's a very demanding technology. You need to have access to electricity to be able to charge it on a regular basis. You need to be able to have the, the money to credit your device so that you constantly have the required data bundles to be able to um, continue interacting through the mobile phone. And of course, you need to have that connectivity to the infrastructure, uh, as we've been alluding to all along. And then you find that the economic position, socioeconomic position of many migrant communities does not give them the privilege of engaging with the most sophisticated smartphones. The social political climate is also very important. If um, any of these agencies, and I mentioned earlier there are over 150 working in the Rohingya camps, if any of these agencies want to use mobile information health, that is you put information on a mobile device and you make it publicly available to communities so they can access a host or range of subjects within health, you have to have the government's approval. And going through that process requires quite a long and tedious process. The bureaucracy often takes time in being able to realize and give the necessary access to some of this information. So when research made all this apparently visible, our partners therefore said, OK, what is the best way then to make sure that they still get access to information? And here they combine, you know, um, what I can refer to as a hybrid approach to uh, making information available to these communities. So they would download some videos or maybe images because infographs speak volumes, uh, pictures also say a thousand words, videos are very entertaining. And when you take this device and you sit down with young ladies in a community or mothers or young men and so forth, and they see moving images, it really speaks to them. And they're able to then take this information um, and, you know, make the informed decisions that they need to. Um, but you see, this is very tedious because 
the community workers in the Rohingya camps would then have to move from house to house, taking this information to these communities, specifically because of these situations. You can't just put a technology and then all the children will now start learning. Um, there's a, lo a lot more that needs to be done structurally, uh, environmentally, to ensure that people actually do learn. Um, and so yes, technology does help. It does definitely help, but on its own, it's not going to solve the, the challenges we face in the world today.